Chapter Twenty of the Yellow Sheet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Yellow Sheet, the LibriVox NanoRimo Project, two thousand seven. Chapter Twenty, written and recorded by Michael Serwa. Leaving the airport, heading toward Elizabeth's ranch house, a few miles west of Big Horse Island, Montana. They rode in silence in the car, allowing Iko time to reflect on her many pasts and futures, and her one and only now, the moment that is always shifting, always pushing itself into the past. For most people time was a line on which they rode through life. They could look back along the line, and pick out sections, memories, to ponder. They could peer forward and anticipate what might lie ahead as they passed from point A to point B to point C. But the road ahead was never absolute, no matter with how much certainty they might envision it. For Iko, and those few like her, time was more akin to a twisting river that folded back and forth along its own length. For Iko, it was possible to move from one section of the river to another, jumping from an earlier part of this chronometric stream to a later one, if she needed to go forward in time, or reversing direction to go backward. The standard metronome that applied its steady beat to the time that others experienced didn't apply to Iko and her fellow time-shifters. For most people, memories were just a mental representation of an event, something that was stored within them, available for recall, but not real. Iko's memories were actual places and people and events that could be visited. Even before the great rupture occurred, though, the one that Iko was on her way to try to correct, she had discovered that there were many drawbacks to being able to move back and forth this way. The most profound was the effect it had on one's physical presence. A few travelers had been known to slip away from their true present and return moments later, having aged by decades, almost unrecognizable to their friends and loved ones. In their wanderings on their temporal river, they often lost their bearings and their ability to move to specific points on the continuum. Years passed for them as they shifted from place to place, time to time. Many became so disoriented that they no longer knew one reality from another. Many ended up in mental hospitals, unsure of themselves, or their identities, or their abilities. This was why the Zen training was so important, why Dogen was so vital to her. Dogen Michichika, a temporal traveler himself, had decided to remain in this time, rather than returning to thirteenth-century Japan. The decision to stay came from reading in Wikipedia about his death in the year 1253. He knew he would not be returning to his time of origin, but he also sensed that something in his wanderings along the time pathways had drawn him here. Of course, if he accepted his own teachings he could do no other thing, for it was obvious that he is where he was just as surely as he was where he is. His journey was the proof of his earlier musings on time and self, in his manuscript Shobogenzo. The way the self arrays itself is the form of the entire world. See each thing in this entire world as a moment of time. Things do not hinder one another, just as moments do not hinder one another. The way-seeking mind arises in this moment. A way-seeking moment arises in this mind. It is the same with practice and with attaining the way. Thus the self, setting itself out in a ray, sees itself. This is the understanding that the self is time. His thoughts on time and self were just thoughts in 1253, before he slipped away on the temporal pathways. But now that he had arrived in this century, he found it natural to accept now for what it was and is everything, and nothing. It was not until he met Iko, though, and realized what she was capable of, that he knew it was her that had brought him here, not the randomness of nature. All time and space were beginning to collapse, and now they knew it all began with Elizabeth. It was evident from the reports of the fragmented wanderings of so many, and Iko was the key, the blue tulip, the yellow sheet, the one who knew and didn't know. Iko looked out the window. They had left the Glacier Park International Airport twenty minutes ago, so they were now approaching Kalispell, about a third of the way to Dayton, where they would find the turn to the house. 
Kalispell had an airport, but it didn't have adequate runways for the bombardier, so they had to land further north. It would only be a slight delay. They would be at Elizabeth's unoccupied house soon enough. Iko thought that if Elizabeth had only been fortunate enough to have met Dogen Michichika, or if she had met Kairos much earlier, she might have been better able to control the gift, or, or curse, depending on your viewpoint, and this universe and the others connected to it wouldn't be in such a jumble. Iko caught herself contemplating Elizabeth's situation, and laughed inwardly at her own inability to stay in the now. It could be the easiest thing in the world sometimes, and yet it was often the hardest as well. It reminded her of the comic strip she had seen recently, where a teenage boy was telling his girlfriend that he always chooses to live in the moment, and then he adds, Unless the moment sucks, and then I choose a different moment. Very zen-like. Maybe she should tell that one to Dogen, something to add to his collection of koans. Iko couldn't stop thinking about Elizabeth, though. Elizabeth's problems, and by extrapolation everyone else's, all stemmed from control, her lack of it, and her inability to give it up when it got in the way. Iko was faced with a dilemma of her own. Everyone was giving her advice, and everyone was giving Elizabeth advice, and the advice conflicted most of the time, and sometimes, since she was privy to everything Elizabeth did because of the temporal shifts, it was hard to keep all of the realities separate. On the plane, Iko had said, Eviter et de choisir, to avoid is to choose, one of her favorite quotes by Jean Paul Sartre. Sartre's existential nature had kept her grounded in the world when she began her Zen studies under Dogen. She thought the two philosophies conflicted with each other, the way her beliefs about the nature of the job she was about to do contradicted her own core nature. In time she came to see that the grounding of existentialism and Zen were actually very compatible. In fact, nothing was more natural. But Elizabeth's multiple realities and Iko's grounded nature were so dissimilar, how would she ever be able to reconcile them? These thoughts weighed heavily on her. In one of Elizabeth's realities, the tallest man she had ever seen told her that she created her chaos, and said, It does not rule you. Choose your reality, Elizabeth. So, when the time came, should Iko choose, or not choose? If, as Sartre suggested, she avoided choosing, she would be choosing anyway, by choosing to avoid choosing. And whose reality should she choose, hers or Elizabeth's? And would there be any difference anyway? In her brief time with Dogen a few weeks ago, he had postulated that one solution might be to search for the simplest explanation, a la Occam's razor. But how would she find the simplest path in a series of unbelievably complex, always shifting scenarios? There were too many questions, and she was overloading her circuits with this continual searching through the myriad number of possible answers. She shut her eyes and tried to relax, to empty her mind of all the effluvia of the every day emptying the cup so that there would be room for the tea of understanding. Then the answer came to her unbidden. The yellow sheets. In a simple unfolding of each tiny piece of paper the answer was there. We know. She knew, and Elizabeth knew. They just didn't both know that yet. When the time came she was sure the answer would be there. She let herself drift off to sleep, and it was a deep, dreamless sleep, one of those rare quiet times devoid of dreams or other sensory input. Nicky turned to ask her a question at one point, but the peaceful look on Iko's face stopped her. Iko dozed until the car began rocking on the final stretch of the dirt road that led up to Elizabeth's house. The four of them walked up to the house, everyone except Iko curious about what would happen next. "'Can we come with you?' Nicky asked. "'To the summit of the ridge?' Iko answered. "'Yes.' What's going to happen when we get there? Smiling, Iko said, Yes. Dogen laughed aloud. Ah, now that is a shitstick. They walked slowly. The trail was steep in spots, and Dogen and Ame, because of their age, had more difficulty climbing than Iko and Nikki. Nikki was anxious to get there to see what was going to take place, but Iko was at peace with it. It would happen, or it wouldn't and when they arrived at the plateau atop Beelzebub's washboard wouldn't make any difference. The when of now was of no significance, only the when of then, the then of the explosion. 
Having methodically worked her way through all of Elizabeth's memories, she was certain that the problems began with the explosion of the atomic bomb. In order to reset the temporal aberrations, and return everything to a state of normalcy, Iko would have to contain the shock wave, and see that it didn't affect Elizabeth. To do that, first she would have to shift to that exact moment and to that location. Iko was sure that controlling the temporal displacement would be simple. She had enough control, there was that word again, to manage that. Making sure she ended up at the exact location was problematic, which is why they came here physically. Being here would allow Iko to focus, don't focus, let go, on just the shift in time, and help her maintain a static physical location. Finally they arrived at the top by the easiest route possible, up through the valley that led down to the house and the lake beyond, and up the gently sloping hillside. Beyond the ledge, the same one where Elizabeth, Liz, was a few months before, it dropped nearly a half-mile straight down. Iko said her good-byes to Ame, Nikki, and Dogen. Nikki wanted to know what was going to happen, what they would see. Not much, Iko told her. One second I'll be there, and then I won't. She took her place at the cliff's edge, not too close, nodded to the three of them, closed her eyes, and then faded out of sight. The ground was shaking fiercely now, and Liz was gripping the face of the cliff with every ounce of strength she could muster. Next to her one of the two women was doing the same, but hanging on more through a mixture of sheer terror and adrenaline than because of any rock-climbing skill she possessed. On the other side of her Liz could see another woman tumbling lazily through space, screaming as she headed toward the rocks below. Neither of these people had been in sight when she arrived at the peak mere moments ago. And then flying overhead, a man dived over the cliff edge, arms outstretched. Liz looked up from her perch on the rock face as he flashed past. No, it couldn't be. Derek? He headed toward the slowly tumbling woman's form below him, not seeing the two women clinging to the rocks, and gained on her rapidly. Looking back up at the cliff edge, anticipating the shock wave any second, Liz saw a figure at the edge of the cliff. It, it was a woman, and, unbelievable as it seemed to her at the time, the shape of the woman seemed to flicker into existence like the image on an old TV set. It was as if she warmed into being. She just stood there, and as Liz stared in fascination, the air seemed to open up around her and then close again. The rock face stopped shaking. No blast of superheated air came roaring over the top of the rock face, and, most importantly, although she wouldn't know this for some time, Liz didn't fragment and shift into a dozen different universes. "'Thank God!' the woman next to her exclaimed. "'He caught her!' It took Liz a moment to realize that Jennifer, who would introduce herself a few minutes later while they climbed toward the top, was talking about Derek reaching Alice, her partner in the Kalispell Police Department. While they watched Derek and Alice drift down to the open range below, Jennifer told Liz why they had been observing her for a while, but that's a story for another day, as are Liz's eventual time shifts when she discovered her abilities under more ideal conditions. Nikki, Ame, and Dogen slowly made their way down from the high plateau. Father, Nikki asked, will we see Iko again? Time will tell. Do you think she fixed the problem with time? Time will tell. Nikki looked upset. Don't you play Zen with me? How will we know if she was successful? Looking down the long stretch of valley, Dogen noticed two figures below them coming closer. I believe your answer is coming our way. Derek and Liz spotted the three of them working their way down the hillside. Derek said, Two of them look a little old to attempt that climb. I hope they'll be okay. Looking up as the group of three approached, Liz noticed the gaze of the old man fixed on her. There was something familiar about his eyes, but she couldn't figure out what it was. Yeah, she said, puzzled. I think they'll be fine. Want to invite them to supper? End of chapter 20 and the end of the yellow sheet. The LibriVox NanoRimo Project, 2007.